I sent you for next week, so that didn't help you. No, that didn't help. And the phone <laughs> number was good too, but you know, it made sure I was up and at them this morning. Alexis, the link just came now. Thank you very much for everybody. Takes a village. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, go ahead, John. Okay, it sounds like we can call today's economic development meeting to order. Um, and we will take roll call. Laura, would you like to do that? Yeah, I'll do it. I'm just going to go down to who I see here. Oops. Okay, I have Alexis Kim, um, Brian Backus. Here. Dart Strayer. Here. Denise Murphy McGraw. I'm here. Janet Wynn. Here. Um, Jean Bodie. Jean's here. She's joining us today instead of Clark. Um, John Delarada. Yes. Kevin Walsh. Yep. Good morning. Uh, Matt Yetto. Stan Faninsky. I'm here. Matt's here. Oh, thanks, Matt. Stan's here, too. And Yasmin. I'm here. And Dennis. I'm here. And then Paul Briggs. Yes. And then there's two other people joining by phone that I don't know. Could you just identify yourself for the record? Josh is here in the 4529. You're probably see, probably seeing Janet too on the two three number. Oh, you're too. Okay. Yes. All right. So we've got everybody. Okay. So that brings us to any public comments or concerns. Do we have anybody from the public here today? Um, I did not receive any emails um, or letters of concern from the public for the meeting today. And just for the record, Michelle Martinelli just joined. Okay, very well. That brings us to the minutes. It looks like we have the July 10, 2020 minutes attached to today's agenda. Are there uh, any? I didn't get a chance to attach them. I apologize. I have 20 minutes left on the minutes, and I was hoping to do them when I got home yesterday, but I had a surprise visitor come over to our house. So <laughs> uh, we'll have to have two sets of minutes at the next meeting. Okay, and that brings us to the resolutions. So oh, the first um, the first resolution that we have is the chicken code. We call the public hearing on it. Um, I mean, I listened to the public hearing. I didn't hear the only thing I, that I remember hearing that was kind of substantive about the code itself was the fees um, and that they didn't want the fees, the town to be making profit off of the building application fees. And I can assure you that um, that we do not make profits off of our building application fees. I think that's just a cover, and it doesn't cover very much of the work that goes into reviewing the building permits and doing the inspections and such things. Um, so if you guys heard anything else at the public hearing, um, you can chime in, but I did attach a new updated code, and the updated code actually really takes into account what my staff had talked about, the ones that would be implementing the code. And um, also, I had heard from Bill McPartland, um, who's kind of familiar with the issues that come from building code because he was on the Zoning Board of Appeals for a while, and he just had some concerns with setbacks and things like that. Um, so, so, so quickly, we added definitions. Um, you know what? I'll do this quickly because everybody loves code. Yes, they do. Um, So I've got the, de the definitions for a head enclosure, just because it was a little confusing whether or not the head enclosure was the structure itself or um, the whole thing, the structure and the fence. Um, so we added a definition for head enclosure and run here, um, which are just consistent with the way that we talked about them for the rest of the code, but just so that there's clarification there. And then um, under regulations, everything is, um, everything is essentially the same under regulations, except that we um, made enclosures, runs, and fences its own kind of thing. And then inside it, 
Hensel will be kept in, you know, covered, predator-proof, well-ventilated hen enclosures. Um, and then just to be clear, hens have to be contained within a run or fenced yard at all times. It doesn't really matter if um, the run, if, if uh, there's, I guess, people in the world that might want to have free-ranging chickens, but they can't free-range in other people's yards. So we're just saying they have to be fenced. It can be a small run around the chicken um, enclosure, or, you know, you can just have your entire backyard fenced and keep your chickens there. And that is, that'll just play out when um, we're looking at the building permit. Uh, hey, Lori. Yeah. So I have a question. Um, I know we're using chicken and hen. Um, inter we're introducing it as a spam because I mean it's called the chicken code, and that we have obviously saying no roosters. But should we put something in there that says that? And so when the word hen is when the term hen is used within this code, it's not it has the same meaning as chicken. Uh, I mean, yeah, you can do that. Well, it doesn't though, because well, it's chickens anywhere except for under regulations, because under regulations no roosters are permitted. So then everything under just under this section of code is hens because that's all you can have. And then it goes back to chickens. So is it this is gonna sound like a, a very elementary question. Is it is it a rooster is a type of chicken that's a male and, and a hen is a, a female chicken? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we should we spell that out because I mean if I'm I am i am not the I'm not sure if I'm the only one who didn't know that distinction. Yeah. But, um, I think it might be confusing. Yeah, Although, yeah, yes. Absolutely. So we can add a definition there. I'll make that as a note. Um, these are all just proposed changes, and I just wanted to get them out there, you know, to discuss now so that we can, you know, talk about them at agenda meeting if you want to, um, so that the final will be ready to go at the end of the month for you guys to vote on. I have one question, Laura, if you have a moment. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, I, um, um, I think it's F, uh, section F about uh, uh, discontinuance. All right. If you have a discontinuance, is the expectation that the uh, enclosure and run get taken down when you're done with the uh, permit? Yeah, that is the expectation. That's why the building inspector would conduct a final inspection on the property. Yeah, I don't think it says that, though, if you read it. I, I think that's missing because because if it's if it's an accessory structure like you state, so accessory structure would be permitted. So if the chickens went away for, say, they took a, a two years off and they want to get back into it, the expectation they have to take the permit would go out, but would they have to take down the structure for those two years? I, um, there and there. I mean, that's something that we, can, that we could work through with the building permit, but um, I mean, there isn't anything that bars you from having, um, you know, like, I mean, I'm not sure what you can store in a hen house. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. So you could have an accessory structure, especially if the ZBA grid in a variance and the variance runs with the property. Wouldn't you yeah. have an accessory structure that? it's fully permitted even if it doesn't have chickens in it yeah i mean i think you could like yeah. but so what would be the harm in having a chicken coop with no chickens in it yeah, yeah i don't see the harm i'm just saying it's not clear that whether uh the discontinuance requires uh dismantling of the uh accessory structure and run that's all yeah I mean we could add clarification except i don't think that the discontinuance of use would require it I just, I'm just not sure, like, you know, if you're counting your accessory structures, how useful it is, how useful as an accessory structure, you know, without chickens that is. <laughs> yeah, I understand, but you still need to, you know, it just needs to be clarified. You still need to maintain it, obviously, because of code enforcement, if it you well, know, were to, you know, fall down or whatever, you know. It, it's interesting, Kevin, because some chicken coops are getting to be quite elaborate. If you look at what was going on at Long Island and some of the... Um, Ritzier areas mm -hmm. that have chicken coops. They're kind of really making them into uh He's you know, kind of like a, a small place to sit down in while you're feeding and watching your chickens as well as as habitating the chickens. So um I don't know if we have to have an expectation that if you don't have any hens or chickens in there, you have to take it down. Uh you know, why Yeah, I, I agree with you, John. Yeah. I don't think you need to take it down. I just saying it wasn't clear when I read it. That's okay. all. Okay. Okay, right. So I'll highlight that. I mean, maybe we can look at the language, but I mean, the intent, and if it's not clear, you know, we can maybe clarify it, would be that the building inspector shall conduct a final inspection of the property and the permit for keeping the hens shall be terminated. So, I mean, you go out there and make sure that there were no longer hens on the property. If they had removed, you know, the accessory structure, great. If they want to keep the accessory structure, I think that's something that he would work out um, with them. They'd probably need to pull, you know, like a separate 
permit to make that accessory structure not necessarily related to the building permit for the chickens. Um, I do feel like we can handle that administratively, but if we want to change the language, just to make that more clear. Yeah, it's up to the committee. I just, when I read it, it kind of felt like uh, we were missing something. That's all. Mm -hmm. And Laura, I just had two questions. So I'm looking back at the original iteration of this code that we had worked on back in, it feels like forever ago, maybe June. And one of the um, conditions that we had was no no enclosure shall be closer than 25 feet to yeah, next door. Yeah. Is that the reason I would take that out? Um, because actually, I think b both my staff and um, Councilman McPartland were concerned about the way that that would work and felt like it was much better to just classify this as an accessory structure and all of the and have the entire weight of the zoning code <laughs> come down on oh, this. Um, so it, it means that the, the accessory structure already can't be located within a certain distance between an adjoining property. So it's not as if we're going to create a problem where it, this would be next on my property line, right? Right, right, exactly. So oh, there isn't okay, there right, isn't right. anything that would allow you to put anything closer than five feet to a property line. Mm -hmm. um, and then if it's you know bigger, then it has to be twenty feet away from the property line or whatever. Um, that was interesting because it was to adjacent person's house, but then it was involving, you know, reaching out to your neighbor and neighbor on neighbor things are never great. So I think like both my staff and um, Councilman Parkland thought it would be better to just treat it the same as any other accessory structure and have the full weight of the zoning code, um, you know, guide where the placement of the, of the and, enclosure would go. And Laura, what is the treatment of an accessory structure just to, so I'm yeah, So if it's greater than 120 feet, then it has to meet all of the setbacks for, you know, a major accessory structure, which, you know, like in R1 and R2 are collectively like 20 or well, 20 for R1 and 15 for R2 um, distances to the side yard lot lines, 35 right. and 30 to the rear. If it's under 120 square feet, so under like 10 by 12, you're getting pretty small, then it can go within five feet of the lot lines. Okay. So it's more like a, a, a shed is more that you can have five feet from the line, right? Anything bigger? Well, I guess depends how big the shed is. Right. Okay. Then it has to be away from the lot line. And, you know, yeah. we also took the, um, it, and this is different because in, in the, Zoning code, you can have accessory structures in the side yard, but this specifically says that no enclosure will be located in the front or side yard. So that adds additional protection um, to keeping things not so close and not so tucked up against the neighbor's properties. Because typically, um, most homes are kind of set along the same line, especially in high density areas. So if you can't have it in the front or side yard, you're typically, you know, probably going to be tucking it in the back corner there of your property. Yes, because you're only going to have so much room if you have a corner lot in your bed right. to have this. Okay. Yeah, corner lots, yeah, have even more restrictions because they have a lot of side yards mm -hmm. and front Thank yards. Thank you. Yeah. And Laura, my one other comment is that we originally had in the code, in the, the proposed code, um, that the permit expired and had to be renewed each year. And yeah, I, don't, I don't know who put that in. That is not a good oh, idea. That was in <laughs> And the reason why I thought that that was prudent, whether it be one year, two year, three, just like how we do with, um, is it, yeah, with, and with, um, is it home care units? I know that there's one every year that you have to renew, uh, that um, you know, asks me to follow up on usually. But, oh, like open permits, I probably, but, um, the reason I say that is because this is, we have no ability to enter someone's property unless it meets the standards of, you know, we have an administrative warrant or we have reason to believe there's definitely a, a violation. And I think that making, having someone, uh, giving them a permit and then, you know, they, we could not hear back from them for 20 years, or that, that would uh, make it so that we don't really have an idea of how many chickens are really out there. I just think that there is some some, uh, some wisdom in maybe making it either two years, three years that they have to come back in. It doesn't necessarily require a new fee. I just think I'd like it to be annually. I mean, everybody yeah. can talk about it, but I just, for my two cents, I would like it to be annually for all of the reasons you just mentioned, Alexis, you know, we have no ability to just start walking onto people's property, nor would we want to. Um, okay. But that gives us some sort of scope. It yeah. also, it is not unlike how we do virtually everything else. Um, we really only annually renew uh, pre-existing non-conforming uses and home occupations and um, 
but those are much bigger and they're rarer. You know, even if they just have to come in and sign an affidavit, like, so I know that we don't want to put too much work on Tom and Ken, but even if they have to come in and just sign an affidavit saying that the, no conditions have changed, I understand the regulations. And the reason I also say this is because once you issue a permit, that person has property right in the permit. And if we realize, you know, a year in that this is not working and we right. want to end the chicken code, then we want to be able to say, we don't, well, they're going to phase out like any permits currently outstanding will not be renewed rather than have to deal with the issue of, um, hi everyone, we're not doing this. All of the permits that you have and you have a property right in are, are no longer valid. I mean, I don't think that it's, it, we're a complaint driven office. So like if the chickens are causing problems, it's not difficult for the building inspectors to get back there. Typically it's the next door neighbor that's, at, that's saying things are going on back there and I don't like it. And they will grant access to our building inspectors to go look and then they can easily see whether or not there's violations. Um, and it's a lot of extra work on my department that I don't think is necessary. And I think that any time that there's really a problem, it falls into the regular enforcement that we're comfortable doing. Um, I don't recommend it. You guys can oh, overrule no. me and I'm fine and with I it and then we'll do it, but I don't recommend to, it. And I want you to be prepared for that because I don't get the sense from my colleagues that there's overwhelming support to begin for this to begin with. So well, I don't want it to be a burden. Uh, I mean, that sounds like a big burden on the resident as well as the town every year. I mean, I don't know what. But how is it on different? Gonna, that, how is it different from yeah, lawn fees and dog licenses and every other thing that we do as a government? Why are we going to do something different here? So, I, mean, I don't know. I say it's I don't just know that a lot of those things are that. being followed. I mean, does everybody renew their dog licenses? That was a big issue, right? And we had to send something out. I. The more you put on people, the, the kind of the less they're going to do. Um, but I don't know. It just seems to be a little excessive to me. I don't. I don't see the. I don't really see the the, the benefit of it. I mean, what's the benefit of having them renew it every year? Well, I would say the benefit is more. So as a protect, as an, the efficacy would be that in that this is kind of our first year. I would say we're we're committing to this for the long haul. Uh, in which, in which we are, but I mean, this would provide us with the ability that if this is definitely not working out, that we just say anybody who has a permit right now that they will not be able to renew it at the end of the year because we're no longer doing this program. It will like have a basically build in a sunset in the event we need to do that. And also, it, to the extent that we decide, okay, you no, know, people should really only be able to have four chickens, and we need to amend the code, and they have a permit outstanding that's allowing them to have six. I mean, I think that it allow it gives us flexibility in to look at this brand new code that we've never had before, and to you know look, look check back in six months, see if there needs to be any changes, and if those changes are going to affect what we had authorized the person to already do under a permit, we can correct that when they come in to renew it. And I mean, to the extent that it's an administrative burden, I don't think it's going to require code enforcement to actually go out. It would be like almost like how we did the affidavit during COVID affirming that you know you are doing emergency work it would just be the same work like i'm affirming that i still have you know still six six chickens and that's it i mean if you can have a fee that you think is reasonable it that, does in my case that does seem to make sense as far as being able to amend it easier or discontinue right. it easier that does make sense okay so we will add that language back in Um, I'm not sure that you necessarily need the discontinuance of use if you're requiring the annual, annual new renewal, because essentially if you discontinue, you're not going to annually renew, but we can look at that. Okay. Um, also removed, and I, I'm not sure 100% why this got publicized the way that it did, but we had removed, you know, the police element of this a while ago. And that was because the police automatically have systems to take care of when animals are being abused. And that falls into the way that they have their standard operating procedures for things. Um, so all we have is for enforcement is just regular, the way that the building inspectors enforce things. Um, which is fine. And, you know, if there's something that's over and above zoning code and building code violations and nuisance, you know, that's going to fall into the realm where the police have all the systems that they need in place to handle that. So, um, so th this just um, kind of mirrors and e echoes how the building department enforces things. 
which my staff's comfortable with. We did up the fine to $250. For some reason, it said 50, <laughs> which is like less than the permit. Um, maybe not the greatest incentive to not be creating nuisances. So we upped it to 250 for a fine. Six hands. Are we cut? Did anybody have any questions on any of the changes? I will add definitions of hen and rooster, um, add back in the annual renewal, and clarify the um, discontinuance of use if it's still needed. So, Laura, going back to your last point, you know, I've been concerned about the lack of a real animal control officer in the town ever since I was um, visited by like a 75 pound raccoon. Um, so it's mm. become like my issue now. Um, Laura, do you think that this, like we, this would, when you keep saying the police, the police, is this more of an animal control issue if you think they're being abused or they're running wild through the town or, you know, so, you know, all these uh, scenarios we're getting emails about. Yeah, I mean, I I did take this code to the public safety meeting, yeah, and yeah. like the, I mean, police the police have literally been chasing roosters around at midnight at times <laughs> in the town of Niskayuna. I mean, they have, yeah, yeah. and that's just you know the officers that are just driving around, and then you know they do have provisions for animal abuse. So if you know they have a partner that they work with, it's like Schenectady County something rather um yeah, protective yeah so we, have a, we have a contract with them for schenectady county animal yeah animal. and so, i mean i don't know, know if that's only for only dogs. for dogs only for dogs it's only dogs mm -hmm. so i think we need to re i i'm not looking to add additional money to the budget for any topic whatsoever but this i think is one we just keep coming back to we really only have at dog control and dog issues so if we're going to be adding additional things i think we've got to go back to Having an actual animal control. There is somebody um, on our kind of sad story property on uh, Van Antwerp there, Joel Pompey's house. Yeah. Who was helping us with the cats, though. It's dogs and cats. Animal oh, it is. Animal oh, okay. Is dogs. Oh, it's okay. an animal shelter. So animal shelters don't take chickens and raccoons. It's, it's a dog and cat thing. So is the question we're trying to answer is what we would do if we have to impound a chicken? And I think that question is we need an actual animal control officer. So it's a separate thing, but I'm just trying to, yeah. you know, this Maybe is another example ask. of it. I know there's a very vibrant chicken community in the Siena. Maybe perhaps they're aware of a chicken sanctuary or something where we can drop off chickens. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, thought, I know it sounds like a stretch, but I was surprised at the number of people belonging to that constituency of people. Okay. Mm. Are we comfortable with the number six? I don't have a problem with it, but is that is that a good number? Six hens, up to six hens? That's what the host does, and I believe that's what, is it Colony? Okay. And All Albany, right. Albany has six too. All right, very well. Anything else on chickens? Uh, no. So what I think we'll do is make these changes and then I know we don't really have packets for agenda, but uh, maybe we could just upload it to the town board news and announcement steps or something and just, you know, at agenda meeting, like verbally tell people to go look at it if they're interested um, so that everybody's aware of the changes from public hearing to potential action on in, in August. That would be great. Okay. And this will be effective upon, you know, once it's filed and, and complies with the municipal home rule law. So plus or minus September 1st-ish, Laura? Uh, yeah, I'm not as familiar with that as I could be. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't really know. Yeah. <laughs> um, next set of codes. I'm gonna get you a chicken for your birthday, Laura. So I, I like chickens a lot. My uncle has them and they're wonderful in his yard, but I do not have the bandwidth to take on chickens right now. So I would not appreciate that. <laughs> I think um, you're going to change your mind once you see these chickens. It's not that I, you know, wouldn't like the eggs or the chickens. I like them a lot. I, I just, I'm maxed out. So. I know, Calvin, uh, Delorado, are you going to be the first in line for the first <laughs> Absolutely. 
<laughs> can't can we imagine John tending to his coop, his flock around? The oh, I can't I'm wait. I'm looking forward to it. John, I'll going to visit your chickens. I'm going to sit back with a glass of wine and watch my chickens. Watch chickens. There you have it. And my my uncle's had him for probably 20 years. Um, wow. Every time we go, we always have fresh omelets for breakfast. <laughs> and they're cute. And but, I mean, he's up in the Adirondack, so they wander around and they literally, like, you know, eat all the bugs in his yard and stuff. But for people who decide that they want to free range them, they do. <laughs> they poop all over the place. <laughs> mm. You just have to be used to it. So here's the zoning code. Um, we're adding in definitions for e cigarettes, electric vehicle charging stations, and infrastructure, marijuana products and non visible fences. And these are all the ones that are just kind of quick and easy, um, non controversial that we're hoping that we've talked about before. Adding in setbacks for the neighborhood mixed use building, for some reason, they're just not there. Adding in a requirement for electrical ve electric vehicle charging stations for um, parking areas, new parking areas that are going to have build more than 50 parking spaces. Um, and adding a um, size limit to temporary signs. There was a couple of temporary signs that went up a year or two ago that were just ginormous and potentially <laughs> uh, even at one of them was a safety hazard in the wind. So I think that that really brought to the forefront that we needed to have um, a size limitation to our temporary signs. And then um, the non-visible fencing, we've had this, we've bounced this around a lot. This is very similar to what you've seen, but the CAC was reviewing it on Wednesday and notice that just for clarity, we should probably say that, you know, for, for the purposes of uh, the zoning code, that non-visible fences are not considered an accessory structure. Um, if they're under the fence code and um, also they wanted to say that no dog having been found a dangerous dog shall be confined only by a non-visible fence you know, it would be okay if you had a physical fence and then a non-visible fence and whatever you could do to keep your dog in just not only a uh, non-visible fence and then here's the part that you guys have really been asking for is to make sure that e-cigarettes and marijuana, well, I think you guys have mostly been asking about e-cigarettes, but the planning board has had the issues with the marijuana. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, we've got them both in there and that's just the thousand foot radius from the schools, nursery schools, schools of private instructions and daycares. It's um, still allowable, but the, you know, it generally pushes these things now out to like State Street and some of the areas that are not so obvious to children and teenagers. Um, I'm thrilled with all of this, Laura. Thank you very much. I mean, you know, the non-visible fence thing was my thing for a long time, like three years ago. I'm glad we're finally getting to all of this. So what's the next step with all of this? Okay, so, and then this is just a typo. Essentially, we're not allowed to have uh, ad hoc members. They have to be alternates. And that's all that we're putting forward right now. Um, CAC took action on it on Wednesday and recommended an egg deck. They felt that the code changes were minimal and wouldn't, in impact environment. If anything, they would benefit the environment. <laughs> and um, planning board has a uh, potential recommendation to you guys at the end of this month. So, so um, my recommendation is that you guys can call for your public hearing on you know August twenty fifth, and um, then you can hold the public hearing and take action on it at the same time. So this is. We talked about the timeline being two to three months, but I think we were able to compress it. Um, it's going to be like a month and a half because because we've been working at it for a long time. The CAC was familiar with them. The planning board's familiar with them. We're just pulling out the ones that kind of that we struggle with and just getting the ones that, you know, need to be done now through. And of course, Laura, these aren't retroactive, right? So anybody that's got a non-visible fence in right now doesn't have to move it. Right. I mean, unless they change it, but yeah, it's not retroactive. And the same is true for, um, for, you know, the thousand foot radius because yep. people are like, well, they're still selling cigarettes at, I, I don't, maybe Stewart's doesn't sell cigarettes, but I don't know where they sell cigarettes anyway, but there's still, I mean, places that have preexisted that code. Cause that code only came in like a couple years ago, but any new place that comes in can't, okay. they're done. There's nothing they can't. So Thank you. Um, yeah, so my recommendation would be to call for the public, do a resolution calling for a public hearing, and then, you know, at that time, do the resolution 
at the same meeting do the resolution adopting it. I, I really don't think there's anything controversial in there and I think we've gone through the process, so. Um, Excellent. On the resolutions, I didn't write these down because I guess I thought maybe I was gonna talk about them for grants, but at the finance committee, we talked about the rowing club foundation. Um, and that's, I can't remember, 10 or $13,000. So I think it goes beyond finance committee approval and also needs a resolution. Is that right, Janet? I think it does. I'm that's sorry, cool. Laura. Um, I think the, the change order to Pollard um, to do the foundation for the rowing club building, it's, mm -hmm. I think it's either, I can pull it up, 10000 or $13,000. And I think it goes beyond finance approval and actually needs town board action. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So can we put that one tentatively on there as D. And then we talked about this before, but I just wanted to make sure we do not need authorization from the town board to go out to bid for River Road Park. We will only do a resolution accepting the bids when they come back in, right? Um, Are you asking me? No, I think that's Paul Briggs. I'm pretty sure he's told me multiple times we don't need to do that. <laughs> but, You're correct, um, Laura. No, yeah, okay. that's correct. Okay. So the um, bid docs are supposed to come to me on Monday. I got the email from Brian and the Judas yesterday. Um, and I can share them with everybody. And we can also talk about it at the agenda meeting if you want. I he, They think they need to be out there for a while just because everybody's so busy and they are you know concerned about getting good bids. Um, you know, I was like, what about less of a while so we can do it this year? And we're probably going to have to balance at some point. I don't know that we'll be ready to um, accept a contract on August 25th. I can just put it on the agenda just in case. But um, for sure, it would be September. I mean, if you guys want, just, to be, just in case we could put it, we could just talk about it so it's not surprising anybody if we're able to get it something awarded by the 25th or, you know, bids back in by the 25th. Laura, yeah. How much did you say that? How much did you say the change order was? Oh, for uh, Pollard, it's yeah. It's between, like I'd say eleven thousand and thirteen thousand dollars. All right. So if it's up to thirteen thousand, you only need to um, give recommendation, make written notice to the town board, and have the chief fiscal officer's approval. So that would be as me. Beyond oh. the thirteen thousand, um, you would have to have to all, a, additional approval from your committee today. Okay. But you, you do not need a resolution according to the purchasing. Okay, I've got it right oh. here. Oh, it's $11,940. Okay. So you just need to give written notice to the town board and have Yasmin's approval. And you okay. should be all set. Um, right then. So, let's, so I only have then a resolution adopting ch a chicken code and calling for a public hearing for zoning code amendments. I think that's all I got. Unless you guys can think of something else. And I'm sorry, what cost $11,940? That's the addition to the foundation of the rowing club building. Okay, I got you. We talked about it at finance. And we um, don't need a resolution for that, correct? Yes, but Janet's just saying nope. Okay. And then the, um, it's up to you guys. Maybe we could just tentatively put the River Road Park. But the, <laughs> the engineer said that you know, you're going to need a longer amount of time for the bid specs to be out there than normal for a variety of reasons right now. So even if we could get them out on the 12th, like they would only be out for like two weeks or less. So it's probably more likely September. All right. Anything else on resolutions? Um, nope. We're off to the planning board. So Planning board, the kind of main thing on the planning board agenda on Monday is the 2538 River Road, the Kelts Farm Average Density Development. Um, this is gonna be the first time they're looking at it since they are getting the special use permit back to you guys with the constraints of no road connection um, and the entrance off of River Road. I know there was a little bit confusion about the language there, but it, the um, I will have the resolution for planning board, Kevin. Sorry, I know I was gonna email it to you and I forgot. Uh, it does say there it's bike path only between um, Windsor Drive and the new development. So um, Kevin and I, we've just been conceptually like thinking about it. We told Joel not to go ahead with anything until 
you know, the planning board can all take a look at the new constraints that we're looking at the, um, the, it's, uh, you guys granted the special use permit. So now it's kind of the um, preliminary subdivision review. And I think that we're gonna look at maximizing the open space. We have some ideas on um, maybe a pavilion or something in the area of the bike path, a couple other things um, that we can talk about it. So, I mean, I think on Monday, we're just gonna take a look at the versions that we've seen and kind of try and hone in on something that we can work on, get that you know to a place that we like and then really dig in with the engineering. Kevin, you know, feel free to tag on that one if you want you know, to. I, th I think that's pretty much it. Just, I think I mentioned uh, to Alexis or was gonna request that she explain the town board decision so that we get off on the right foot and you know, down the right path. Cause uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I do. And, and of course, I don't know um, how much everybody else knows about and I haven't seen the resolution or the final uh, town board action yet. So, so a good summary to get us off on the right foot would be great on that. Yes, I will be ready for that. And I think that, you know, just as a to commend the planning board, I know that um, the applicant, Joel, is really expecting this to be like a two-year process. And, and I think that the planning board has been moving expeditiously, despite, you know, while also taking into account all of the public comments lately. And hopefully we can, you know, keep moving at this speed and pace. <clears throat> yep. Um, did anybody have any questions on that one? Okay, the ACE hardware received final approval from the planning board for both tenant change and signs. So um, so we're looking forward to welcoming them to a trend center overlay district. Um, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong. I think he said he wants to try really hard to work, you know, straight through the end of summer, early fall and be open by, you know, mid fall, late fall. Yeah, I think after uh, after our final uh, resolution, no, not the final, the, the first one we did, I think he was able to close on the building. I think that's what he yeah, was waiting I think for. Closed. So sounds like uh, should be work in progress now. Yeah, so that's exciting. Um, 859 Pierce Road is a two lot subdivision um, down by like uh, Greg Gifford and um, Methan, some of those subdivisions that we've been looking at recently. Um, 3410 State Street, Upstate Guns and Ammo currently has like, um, I'm gonna say 80 by 20, maybe? No, so it's a large, um, t you know, temporary storage unit. Um, the planning board is understanding that he has constraints on that site with his business and with two front yards and, you know, just a very small kind of unique area in town, but doesn't want to see that remain there forever. It's just, it's not in keeping with the neighborhood or anything that, is going on down there. So they're working with him on potentially creating a, um, like a, like an actual addition to the building that could serve the needs that he's currently using for the, the storage pod. And um, that's gonna be kind of a joint process between the planning board and the zoning board right now. 2141 Eastern Parkway, tenant change. Um, this is coming up for planning board on Monday. There was a dentist office in that building. It's kind of, um, right on the corner of Eastern and is that road? It's all the way at the edges of our town. Um, and the psychologist office wants to take over. So pretty simple tenant change. And then 2465 McGovern Drive is proposed to be um, like a group home by the Center for Disability Services. Did anybody have any questions on those? We don't really have any say over the group home, right? That's that's uh, state run and they're gonna do whatever they're gonna do with zoning and the like? Um, we don't really have any say on whether or not they can and can't go there, but we do check parking and just double check, you know, that they've got, you know, whatever they need to make sure that they're not negatively impacting the neighborhood, which is really just parking. We okay. don't have problems with these homes. <laughs> Generally speaking, um, you know, they, they fit right into the community. The only issue, and we do get fairly regular complaints on these occasionally different of the properties is like parking in the front yard. And so like, if we can get out ahead of it and just have them delineate all the parking and figure out how much staff they're gonna have. So like the one on Balltown Road works amazing. You would never even know it was there because they actually have parking tucked down behind the house and they have a lot of parking back there and it works really great. Not that I'm saying we need to be paving parking lots behind these homes, but 
we just need to be looking at the size of the driveway and making sure that you can fit a fair number of cars there without causing problems. Yeah, that really is the the main, if not the only issue with the group homes. Um, we've had one by my parents' house for the past 20 years, and it's fine except for the parking. Because parking. you have workers coming in and out and sometimes vans, you know, dropping and picking people off. Um, but other than that, you really don't even know they're there. Yeah, I, I agree. It really just comes down to the parking. So that's yeah, really just, all we're going to check. Trash yeah. storage is the other potential item, whether they have a dumpster or, or 48 yeah. garbage cans is the other one. Yep. Um, so we'll just take a look at that one quickly. The applicant has been great. He's been working with Clark on it. Um, zoning board has four cases currently scheduled for August, a bunch of pools again. Um, the grants update, so the, we, um, we moved forward with the change orders to the bathrooms that we talked about at the last meeting. Um, and we just discussed the Rowing Club Foundation authorization. We did have a, a meeting with the county on the crossings. Um, I think that Weston and Sampson is doing a good job. The county has, you know, had this concern before and stated it again that they don't always like the sight lines on St. Joseph um, and they don't want to create an unsafe crossing, which obviously we don't want to create an unsafe crossing either. But when there's already a ton of people crossing there and there's nothing for them, I mean, you're only making things better. Um, so uh, I think that we're going to work with Complete Streets and Wesson and Samson to get them the additional data that they need. I'm trying to get them to a place where they're comfortable so that we can uh, move forward with putting that out to bid. And then again, River Road uh, contracts docks on Monday, um, hoping to schedule a meeting Monday or Tuesday with the rowing or sorry, with the softball club. And I'm Sorry, I actually didn't mean to have the retrofit to Solar Beacon still on the agenda. Um, that is that is in Highway's world. We need to bring that over to Highway. That was where we landed with that one at the last meeting. So, so this is moving along rather slowly, correct? We're not going to see this anytime soon, even though it's been going on for a few years. Which one? The I I wanted to you moved you put your head down and moved quickly onto the I what maybe the next thing the crossing at St Joseph's. <laughs> Well, yeah, the crossing on St. Joseph's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. I mean yes. the county didn't just outright say, yeah, do whatever you want to do. They gave us a bunch of things that we have to do in order to get approval from them. So we will. Right. And they haven't wanted to do it all along. So it just, it's, this is a tough one, but the residents are still looking to have it. And I don't well, I, yeah, I mean, I drive by there probably two to four times a day. And I would say almost every single day there's somebody. Uh, Agreed. Agreed. Like, <laughs> Especially this time of year, that's the way I drive to the pool. So, yes. you, you know, I, you go home, I go that way, and there's cars parked there waiting to cross. I mean, there's all kinds of things going on over there. Yeah. So, Wesson and Samson was saying that, like, pedestrian counts are tough right now, but, you know, I haven't told him this, but I don't think that he will be mad at me. Like, we can literally stick Bill Chapman out there for a couple days. <laughs> He's always willing to do that. And then I was like, okay, Bill, you can call the county personally and report your findings to them. <laughs> there we go. I won't have him do that. <laughs> but he probably will help. We just need some numbers, I guess. And That's good. Thank you. Um, yeah. So the Complete Streets... We talked about this before, has the pandemic survey. Oh, I forgot to touch that. I will email it to you. Laura, has it been released yet? Because I just yeah. was reviewing it and the questions are great, except, I mean, so it hasn't been released yet. No. no I, I, would, I looked at it and just for just for context, everyone, um, for those of you who uh, probably haven't received it unless you're internal, but um, we use a uh, platform called Formstack, which is really the gold standard uh, for online surveys and for analyzing and collecting data. Um, for our daily COVID screening, we did it for a during the pandemic for employees, and we own the do domain name like Miss Town of Miskuna Form Stack Surveys. And so, to the extent, Laura, that we already are paying like a pretty expensive amount to use this platform, I have no problem just transferring these uh, this Survey Monkey to the Form Stack so that Town of Miskuna, and that that way we can, you know, I'm not sure how Survey Monkey who owns this DM, this uh, account, but I mean, I could. I can add, give you permissions as long as you're okay with that. But I think just for consistency that if we're doing like these types of online surveys that I can move it to that plot, that thing we already use. That would be great. I mean, 
this one is probably a little bit, but I've done two now. Um, you know, and Bill Lawrence is trying to get them set up. They are somewhat informal. I, I would much prefer if we were able to use form staff. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Th that's terrific. So we pay for it. Right? So I can just exactly. lower it. Mine, I'll, I'll transfer it to, into form stack so that it's literally, you'll see, and form stack's nice because um, you can have unlimited users who are exported the data on, like I have get, get the COVID uh, daily screenings exported to me every night at midnight. Um, and this one, I can make it so that anybody who you give me their email address could receive those. It also has mobile app features so that you could easily fill it out on your phone. And it's just meant to be the most seamless and easy to use uh, survey. And which we've seen by how many, given that like I think about 150 or 160 people responded to the survey internally, like that just as goes to show how easy it is. Because otherwise- Yeah, that's right. great. That's absolutely great. Because um, SurveyMonkey is nice and you know, it's got cartoons and it's fun, but it's very difficult to share the data. So, and, yeah, not so. Every, and you, as you pointed out, you can't always use all of them on your phone and you can't do a lot of different things. So that would be terrific, Alexis. Yeah, Thank I'll you. Or, just let, I'll do that this afternoon. So if you want, and I'll send it back to you and, and if there's any changes, but I'm just going to model it directly off of um, the one from SurveyMonkey. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad we have that research resource and I appreciate your help with it. Um, so so it just we're just trying to kind of gauge what people are doing, like how their mobility changed during the pandemic, like what neighborhood you live in. Um, <laughs> On average, how many days per week were you walking or biking in town before the pandemic? Um, how often do you generally walk or bike, you know, during the pandemic? Um, does it seem like vehicle drivers are more prepared to encounter bicyclists and pedestrians on the street today than in the past? Um, they've heard that aggressive driving has become a bigger concern during the pandemic. There are many possible reasons for this, but how often do you experience aggressive drivers? How safe from a safety from a traffic safety perspective? perspective do you feel when walking or biking th throughout the town um, before and during the pandemic your overall ability to safely undertake walking or biking since the pandemic pandemic began how do you feel connectivity in the neighborhood and then like these are some of the questions that we really want to see like what could be improved what needs to be improved and then just some like kind of fill out your ideas um, here so that you know that can kind of guide some of the, the priorities that Complete Streets has on there. Um, and I know we had a really great discussion at the last meeting on our fall, on our fall plans for Complete Streets and handing out safety packages and working on educating, you know, people on the safe rules for walking and biking in the town of Niskuna too. So that's still on, um, but we did want to kind of, um, when it's ready, blast that survey out to town residents um, just to help guide the complete streets on priorities. Okay, I just have a, another complete streets issue. I know that mm -hmm. um, Bill Chapman, um, as always, has taken it upon himself to try to communicate and do some liaison with the county. Um, he has raised a couple of projects, and then I know there's folks that are talking about extending the sidewalk that we got from the county about 10 years ago on Rosendale. Mm -hmm. um, so none of this is on the agenda. So it, this agenda doesn't reflect that kind of activity. And do you have an update as to where Bill is? I just was privy to being CC'd on a, an email that he sent out to a large group. Um, I mean, we talked about it a little bit at the Complete Treats meeting. He, is there's actually a couple people driving it and i think two of them are residents on rosendale road and yeah they have reached out to him and said we want to see this happen he said great yeah, no they've reached out to all of us yeah instances, but i think he, he's got that he's got something else <laughs> he wants a sidewalk on cornelia or on some cornelius right yeah cornelius. I mean, he's got a lot of things he's got an aggressive agenda and these agendas in this committee, I assume that's the natural place for it, are, are not reflective of this larger thing that's going on and communicating with neighbors. So I just want to make sure that everybody is updated as to what's going on with Complete Streets. Yeah, I mean, I completely, you know, support, you know, driving, you know, good projects forward in any way, but none of those things have funding or, right. you know, any of those things. So yeah, that's I, my concern, right? That yeah, I kind of just focus on the things that were able to accomplish this year, <laughs> which would mostly just be the grants that we're working on now and the fall project and yeah. um, and the surveying. But, um, uh, you know, 
we were lucky to have a transportation planner on Complete Streets, and he just put together like an estimate of the Rosendale Road um, based on DOT estimates, which are high, to be fair, but you probably do need to use them because, you know, there probably also would be a fair amount of like right of way and private property issues, like the same kind of thing that we talked about on Consul Road. So, um, I mean, yeah, that I would love to see that probably in the span of like 700 to a million dollars. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So you'll share that with everybody. Cause I mean, the, the Rosadale people I hear from daily. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not even sure that I'm on the contact with them, but I think that there isn't any harm in constantly bringing that forward to the county and saying that this is a priority. Like, the, I mean, I don't think the town right now has the money and maybe the county doesn't either, but the more you bring those things to the forefront, the more opportunities they have when they do get, you know, they do get funding, they can be like, oh, well, if we fund this one, these people will stop calling us. <laughs> right. So right. Gonna, like, discourage them from doing that. I, I just think that this, you know, this, um, that that project would be amazing to do that connection and any of those old um, county right of ways that are small, they're heavily used by cars, but they're also obviously really good routes for pedestrians and bicycles because yeah. you know they're super connectors. So to make them safe for that kind of traffic would also be really good. Good. Yes, I agree. Hey, Lauren. Um, yeah. I have to leave in a couple minutes for court. So could you skip down and do numbers 12 and 13? I sure. Just to... um, 12 is just a 918 Northumberland. Um, I'm trying to just bring that one back to the forefront of enforcement. We um, we have information and citations on that property. So I would like for us to focus in on that one if we can. Okay. How bad is it? Are we getting a lot of complaints on that? I mean, it's it's not the open roof of Maple Ave, you know, with the burn scars, but <laughs> it, it's been um, abandoned for over 10 years, I think. Wow. Um, and neighbors have a lot of concern with interior mold, which isn't something that the building department, you know, it's condemned because the power line, the power is turned off. Um, Power lines we know who owns they're turned it? off, <laughs> but they're not we secure. Know who owns it? Is a bank probably? Has anybody expressed? No, that's in... the issue. It's not a bank. It's privately owned by the family. Um, and nobody can buy it from them. It's one of those things where um, it's one of it's one of those things where there's multiple family members involved, and it's uh, not clear who's the owner. And one parent died, and the other one is still alive, but in a nursing home. I mean, it's not a clear cut. We own right. it now. Let's right, sell right, it. Right. It's you know, it's one yeah. of those homes that has had tragedy and you mm -hmm. know. Okay. So I mean, oh. they did put a new roof roof on it not that long ago, which oh. was great. But yeah. you know, they didn't. <laughs> right. They didn't do everything that they need to do. It's not terrible, but I think if we could bring that one to the forefront and just get it a little attention, um, right. that would be helpful. How and about then, the sidewalk on Consol Road? Yeah, and I know I just I didn't <laughs> I moved it to the end of the agenda, but we still just need to look at the drainage and engineering on that one. Right. Um, the aqueduct land discussion, I still have to get the report to you. And the signage issues at Dean Street Park. Um, I just had received a couple comments from people about um, confusion over those signs, and they sent me a picture and I put it in your agenda packet. And I mean, it clearly says private park members only, but at yeah. the top, it says town of Niskuna parks regulations. And I think that the problem is sometimes people are just seeing town of Niskuna parks and not reading any of the signs on the underneath and um, going in there and having, you know, issues. So I know that, you know, signage is probably like a highway parks issue, but one of the things I was gonna ask, and I don't know if we've looked at this before, is, um, is there any way that we can make this a public park and no, no, no. no. So I, I see this every day. I think that Taylor there, the bird on the corner. And I always look at the, you know, town of the first, the top sign, the town of Niskuna parks regulation. And that's right. Cause it says, but it says at the bottom by order of the Niskuna town board. So there must be something in our archives of when we authorize that top sign. But when it says private park members only, I think maybe there could be clarification of who the Nisimino Park District 2 residents are. Yeah. That is. And, I, and maybe like change the order of the signage or combine it all into one sign that says 
private park only, you know, here's the regulations, you know, just so it's I, clear. Yeah, yeah, I think it needs a new sign. So it's I'll causing know. a lot of anxiety over there because people are getting kicked out and don't know why. Been- and then they're calling us. <laughs> I will tell you, it has always been that way. I yeah. never even knew when I got elected a hundred years ago, I never even knew that this place existed. And from pr- practically my very first meeting, the marina of the situation 20 years ago, uh, you know, er- every day, every meeting she would get up. It. So I, di- I think it needs better signage. It certainly needs better signage, but you know, the folks over there who know that they are members of this and that they pay an extra fee, uh, you know, an extra tax on their tax yeah, bill, they tax. know, <laughs> they know. So yeah, they a- know. But, and, and yeah, and I think one of the, um, one of the issues is that they, they know who is in or out, but maybe yeah. enforcing it not necessarily equally across all walks of life. So, um, so just clarifying the signs could help with that so that there's not so much angst over there. I I never, this is the first I have ever heard that it is not being enforced across all walks of life. Yeah. If I, if I walked into there t- today, within five minutes, one of those people would tell me to get out. Yeah. Uh, so I do not I'm think just- that, that, you know, that has, that's a very loaded statement, right? It uh, sounds like a lot of different things. I will tell you, if I walked in there, if you and I walked in together to have a picnic lunch, we brought the kids within five minutes, somebody would come over. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I'm just, I, I, mean I'm just, I get complaints and that's one of the complaints that I've gotten. I mean, I'm sure everybody's experience may be different, but certainly there's that feeling out there. So clarifying the signs is definitely help. I think that's a great way to first start. And I think maybe the best way to start with the peace offering is that perhaps the, one of the NICAP signs that they're donating to the town, we could offer to put there. I would love that. Case. Thank you that very much. Start yeah. of the conversation. So Laura, I don't know who, I don't know who would have the point of contact information for the park um, police there, but if you could provide they, it. They, they, have an elect, they have an elected board, a Marina Franchise, who okay. so, maybe, I can see. so it's very yeah. nice, the president of the board. I'll go speak at the next privilege of the floor. If they have that at their board meetings and I'll try to see if they're willing to do the signs. If, if, I mean, if you're saying that's the best way we should reach them. Yeah. I, they email okay. constantly. I'll email them and ask them if they, you know, we'll talk to them about the signage. I'll put you oh. on the email. I'll connect Great. you with them. It's Mike Cognetti and Marina. So. What's going on with the aqueduct land? Did we, what are we doing with that? If anything? Yeah. Um, we still need a formal proposal, but I was actually going to tie that in with what I think um, we should really focus on as our Climate Smart Community Task Force is budget for our natural resources inventory, because that's really what we need to do is figure out what lands are left, what lands we own, what lands are private, you know, where the best investment is for uh, preserving land. And that way, you know, you can really be comfortable saying this makes a lot of sense to develop or we really should hold on to this. It's very, we have very little of this land left and it's really gonna benefit our town. Um, so I, I would love it. that. I think that's a natural next step. I've gotten so, I never heard of a lupin before. And now I've gotten so many emails from people so sad that all the lupins on River Road are going to be gone because of Kelts Farms. So I absolutely think that that's a very logical next step for us if we have the bandwidth to take that on. Yeah. yeah, and that and that is one of the goals of the comp plan um, 2013. We talked Great. about yep. doing that as well. So exactly. I think that'd be consistent with the long term. Right. I mean, you know, and I always say this, Ed Riley was the king of this, right? That the ta- town was planned very um, in a very determined way to have open lands in various parts of the of the town. And now we've eaten away with that, whether it's Mansion Square, whether it's now Kelts Farms, you know, so to be able to outline that for folks again, uh, Dart, whatever I can do to support you and help you through that, I, we we got to get going, right? No, and yeah. Remember so clearly type... you talking about it 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's the type of thing that you lose a little bit at a time and really you don't know the impact until it's too late. So exactly. I think if we are much more proactive on this, I think we'll be better for it. I agree, Dart. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all. And thank you, Denise, for carrying on for me. And I hope you all enjoy your weekend. My honor, John. Thank Thank you. you. Bye. Um, Oops. Yes. So Tree Council, really no change from...
um, hey, last. Hey, week. Laura. Yeah. Hi, it's Paul Webster. I was on the call. Hi, Paul. Hello. I'm I was on the last call too. Webster, don't worry. Yep. Oh, uh, I will, all I right. Thanks. Yeah, I think you did tell me that. that I will put you in the yeah. minutes. Okay. I'll see you all later. Thank you, Paul. I think he did say that. Okay. Um, just really want to work on Blatnick Park and fall plantings. Uh, Conservation Advisory Council um, has potentially identified an area along the Gulf Range where they can do some outreach and maybe do a low mow project over there. So that's very exciting. Um, made more progress on the lawn pesticide free lawn outreach program last night or Monday night. And um, I actually still don't really know the details of this, but I think community choice aggregation <laughs> has started moving forward. I need to read the emails that they're sending me. No, they're not. They're, they're just starting to, it was on hold. But you mean CCA with mega? It was yeah. on hold and um, now they're starting to ramp back up. I think, I don't know what the end goal date is, but I think it's before the end of the year. So yeah. we have to um, contact them and let them know that there's been a change in our uh, CCA liaisons in so, in so much as that they've been perhaps reaching out to, to not one of me, me or you, but to the former CCA liaison. Um, I, I think I get copied on everything, um, but yeah, that's a good idea to update that. And then, this is what we just talked about for the Climate Smart Community Task Force. I think that our next step really will be focusing on the natural resources inventory, like honing in. And then we had a lot of discussion about this at the last meeting, but the composting project, um, Maya Healy, um, just working with engineering and highway to see if there's a way that um, we can work on that. Um, Architectural Review Board has looked at ACE hardware, still working on it, and then 2804 Aqueduct Road is the old firehouse, um, very close to the Aqueduct Balltown Road traffic circle there at the Rexford Bridge. And it's just kind of a square brick building, a little bit ugly because it used to be a fire station. And the guy who owns it um, is proposing to put a second story on it and redo the facade. So he's going to work with the Architectural Review Board on that, but I think it's a good opportunity to make that building look a lot more residential and maybe mirror what's going on with River's Ledge across the street. So um, we're looking forward to some upgrades to that building from the Architectural Review Board. I, does anybody have any questions on any of those things? So did uh, legal, does legal have anything they want to talk about? Yes, I have three things. So first, um, I wanted to just, I know this time last year, Councilman McGraw had um, received some complaints and, and we send out a ton wide email just reminding everyone about the open burn laws, uh, meaning there's only the three instances in which you can have a fire in a residential area. So I think that we should, that should be on our radar. We can either do it, you know, end of August or in September, maybe proactive so that we're not responding to complaints, but we're just being educational. Um, so that was one thing I wanted to mention. Second, I wanted to mention is that um, I've been talking to Verizon and they're going to begin submitting their app application building permit applications for um deployment of 5g in the right of way um do we do need to, oh so this is going to require a resolution so in the master license agreement that we entered into with horizon and i believe it was in february 2020 we we agreed in there to enact a chapter either within an existing chapter of the code or a standalone chapter addressing um small cell technology and in, in including in that our design standards so that they're uniform the thought being that this is not going to just be something that we're going to be doing with Verizon, but with you know any other 5G carrier in the future. So we had agreed that we would do that within the first year, of, within one year of signing the um, the agreement. So I think that there's no reason in holding up doing that when it's still somewhat fresh in my mind. So I would ask, I propose, and I can have this ready for Finance and General Government Committee, um, just uh, the, a public hearing, calling for a public hearing on this new chapter, and it would just basically state that it, and clarify that um, the five small cell technology is not subject to the um, the portion of our town code that relates to cell phone towers. And where you know what I'm referring to, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that yeah, that's that's I wanted to propose as a resolution item. It might be not ready until September. And then uh, I guess third is um, we have a novel. Uh, Appeal. So in our property maintenance code, it says that um, anyone who receives a notice of violation has the opportunity to appeal that said notice of violation 
um, to a panel of consisting of the chairman of the planning, well, so a member of the planning board, a member of the zoning board of appeals and a code enforcement officer. So Laura and I discussed this and nobody in, in that appeal um, is basically contesting the allegations underlying the notice of violation and saying why you don't need to abate those. Uh, in all of the years that this has been in the code, Laura can't recall any instance when somebody's exercised the right to appeal. So this is going to be, um, you know, the procedures are are those that we're going to have to develop them. And then, you know, this will be the first time we're implementing them. So our thinking is we, instead of arbitrarily picking one person for planning, one for zoning, that we would ask uh, Chairman Goodman and Chairman Walsh to be the two representatives from those boards and that I didn't know this. And Laura, you are a jack of all trades. Laura is a code enforcement officer. So that rather than put Ken or Tom as it, uh, that Laura would be the third person on the panel. So um, that's going to be scheduled shortly. Uh, if, if we're hoping for early next week, the only thing holding it up right now is that there's a accompanying FOIL request and the appellant had asked that we not schedule it until he has five days to review the FOIL documents. So that is, um, it, it, it's always interesting to, you know, to put things in action that have never been used before in the town code. So I don't know if Chairman Walsh is on this call still, but um, that's, be on the lookout for that email. Yes, I am, and uh, I'll do what I can to support, of course. Yes, and it's supposed to, it just there's, I can give everyone a briefing, but it's supposed to be just as impartial. You know, it's the opportunity for the resident to contest allegations, and it's not it's not a uh, litigious or at all an adversarial proceeding. So I maybe would sit in back to answer questions, but I would not be presenting a case in chief. So those are my updates. Thanks, Alexis. Did anybody have any questions on those? Hey, Dennis, do you want to talk about the Friends of the Grange? Uh, sure. Everybody uh, get included in the um, uh, the uh, the agenda here is the information that Matt Wall put together. Matt uh, Wall put together proposal for organizational support to assist in protecting, preserving, and extending the public uses of Rosendale Common School. Um, I met with him. A few weeks ago, <clears throat> and uh, very enthusiastic, obviously, put together quite a document, um, really looking for uh, feedback from people, um, people who are interested, I know Laura, you are, I know Denise, you are, uh, people who are interested in the um, doing something about a way to preserve the uh, Rosendale Common School, the Grange, the um, uh, in eventually forming a, a the idea would be to form a, what is it, a 501c3 organization that would be able to hopefully collect money. And in any case, if any of you are interested, we will go through this, if you have any ideas or any uh, critiques or uh, uh, proposals for improving this uh, and planning this, uh, this uh, organization, uh, you can either contact me or you can contact Matt Wall directly. I don't think his email is on the document, but it's just Matt Wall at Gmail, so it's not all that hard to figure out. Um, but uh, just like to promote this and hopefully find a way to uh, uh, put together this friends group and eventually move forward with uh, uh, restoring the building. Um, and maybe begin to use it as a regular meeting place for the town or uh, maybe a small museum in there or something along those lines to promote uh, history and the school, uh, the history of the schools, perhaps especially in the town. Yeah, this is really great. And I think I'm so happy that he was willing to take it on. He's in the span of like a couple of weeks, like moved us forward miles. <laughs> And um, I, the um, the uh, the plaque from uh, that we got the grant from Cromeroy Foundation for is in Laura's office. Uh, we do have the the plaque, and uh, he mentions it in this uh, in this uh, proposal uh, that it'd be a nice idea to use the unveiling of the plaque as the same time as we begin this uh, friends organization. So sometime in perhaps the fall, but whatever time it takes to get this thing rolling. That sounds great. That's terrific. Very excited and so pleased we got the plaque. Have you had a chance, Denise, by any chance, or Laura, to look through this document? I did. It is I quite did. a great <laughs> document, yeah. He's a, I don't really, I just know him from like, you know, social media and other things, even though he just lives around the corner from me. 
he's a very interesting, fiercely intelligent guy, and he yeah. loves history the way you do, Dennis. You know, that's the connection. I mean, he loves this town and he loves history. So, and, and he wants to do this. And it's, you know, I told him he was surprised to learn because he hasn't lived here forever. This was attempted about 10 years ago. A group came to town board, they mm. wanted to do it, and they just were never able to get it together in terms of organization or money. Um, you know, and I committed to helping then, and I'm still committed today. I think it's a wonderful idea. So thank you for being willing to take it on. Do you know, uh, I can talk to ask another time, but do you know where, is there any documentation of that group? I remember any very vividly. From their yeah, let me let me look through. Maybe I would still have the emails. I just don't know. But I will look. Yeah. Um, they came, they came to town board. They made a privilege. You know, it was not a planned thing. They got up at privilege of the floor, and then I followed up. You, you know me, right? So then I kept yeah. in touch with them, and we had a bunch of emails. We tried to have. We had one meeting, maybe, but you know, somebody dropped off. So it just yeah. it lost steam. Um, but there was certainly. I think a willingness to at least have a friends of group, you know, I think that, it, but it just lost steam as the best I can recollect right now. Yeah, I, I but I'll listen to see who any of those folks were. Didn't ECOS. I had heard want, rumors. I'm sorry. Um, did ECOS want to um, take That's that? exactly Patrick and ECOS, yeah. right? Do you right, remember yeah, this now? That, I remember it. Yeah. That's why I'm saying, I think I could probably find the emails because I'll look up my emails from Patrick. Right. So. But that yeah, was I think exactly, he was the one. We had discussions with him as well. On he the, goes uh, wanted to do it, and then they wanted to move their office to there. Do you remember? Right. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I may have that. something about that in my office. Yeah. Why don't you look? Because I don't even know. Were you town clerk yet? I don't even think you were town clerk yet. Uh, but I I do remember some things that we made. You have. remember this? Good. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, that, so that was the plan, was Ecos would help us develop it. They would kind of take the lead on the fundraising, and then they would try to move from where they were at the time, which was the senior center, and move over there. Uh-huh. All right, well, any you know, names or find. whatever. We'll all put it out. Yeah. Michelle and I will both look, and we'll try to pull it all together for you guys. Yeah. Maybe back in touch with some of those people and see if they have any ideas. Exactly. Yep. Sounds great. What a nice project. Okay. Let's hope so. <laughs> I got a good feeling about it this time. Okay, that's all I have. Is there anything else anybody wants to talk about? Rain barrels? Rain barrels? We jumped over the Girl Scout. I know. So, <laughs> I'm so, that's the place that I'm at in the minutes from last month is the rain okay. bills. <laughs> and I was like, rain oh, I have. Okay, we'll talk about it next month. I mean, it's not, I would just, in soon enough, it's, it's not going to, you know, it won't yeah, be anymore, fun. right? It'll start snowing and people won't be thinking about it or care, but yeah. okay. Keep me posted of how I can help. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, everyone. Thank you and have a wonderful weekend. Laura, thanks for all your efforts. Alexis, yet again, thank you. Thank talk you. Talk to people soon. Thank you.